So I have a strange question to start with actually today. Um, do you think that basketball has been solved? Well, if you were to watch any hoops take or debate full of people talking in absolutes, There's nothing to you would about. just assume that the game has been solved. That's what the analytics say. It's just now a question of, well, talent and execution. That's it. You can't do it without stars. I want to show you why the game will actually never be solved, even if there is an equation for it. It's actually definitely not that one. This is the never-ending pursuit of solving basketball. Every single strategy or system was once unknown and unexpected. A crossover was quite literally a secret. But many people act as if there are no more secrets to be found, even though this is mathematically impossible. To understand this, we need to take a look at a scientific example that has captivated the world for decades. This is a special little desktop toy that explains a lot more than its simple structure. And what you'll notice, even as I attempt to drop it at the same place each time, its path deviates significantly, rather quickly. Tiny little differences lead to disproportionately large differences in outcomes, even for this simplistic toy. What does that have to do with basketball? This is what we call chaos, and it can be found everywhere, certainly in basketball. Chaos can be found in any sport or business, and where there is chaos, there is market inefficiency, and that means opportunity. Players and coaches making more or less than they should, GMs making poor draft decisions. Michael Lewis famously wrote about this in Moneyball, the Oakland Athletics, went after players that just got on base more frequently. They were termed to be undervalued, and the result was the team won a lot, most importantly, with not a lot of money. But this was a contestable book about baseball. Where might the inefficiencies exist in basketball? The opportunities. Fortunately, we have an aid in this exploration. Evolution. Basketball has become a global game, and the spread has produced varying playing styles. In my last video, I discussed one substantial difference at the international level. Ball movements, specifically reversals. Team USA and Team Canada passed on passing. They ranked dead last in the tournament for top 25 teams. Now, most of these Canadian players grew up in the States, either in the familiar AAU circuit or high school or college. They were very much groomed in the same way as these USA players. Um, so is this mostly a byproduct of that AAU upbringing? That's an actual thumbnail of third graders. Um, or is this more of an influence of their time in the NBA? Either way, these losses highlighted a potential inefficiency. Although Canadian and US players are significantly, and I mean significantly more valuable based upon pay, both teams lost twice. Brazil doesn't have a single NBA player, and Serbia, with just two NBA players at the time, was walloping Team Canada without a guy named Jokic. How could this happen? How could Serbia, who has less people than the state of Washington, where I live, be pummeling the talent-rich Canadians? This has to mean one or some combination of the following three things. All four losses were flukes. These international players are undervalued. These wildly talented North American NBA heavy teams are playing in a less efficient Way. Well, with hindsight, we already know that all three of these things have happened in the past. Teams have been upset, international players have been undervalued, Jesus, Jesus, and teams Jesus, have yeah. played in Back inefficient around. ways. But four losses is a lot to be a fluke with so few games. So either these international players are undervalued and or these NBA players are playing in a less efficient way. I don't know that much about him, but... Perhaps the greatest modern NBA dynasty was built upon this framework. Discovery within the chaos. Popovich went where other coaches and GMs hadn't, overseas. 
Obviously, no title team or dynasty completely evades good luck. The Spurs did get the number one overall pick. That ended up being Tim Duncan. He was pretty good. But clearly, Popovich saw something that other GMs and coaches didn't in these international players. The Spurs drafted, acquired, and started more international players than any other NBA team over a period of time. But how much of this winning could be attributed to coaching and how much of this winning could be attributed to a certain type of international style Ginobili. and player? Oh, with the ball. So to examine this, I wanted to look at Spurs players who played for multiple teams. Spurs not named Duncan, Parker, or Ginobili. Less celebrated Spurs. To see if any patterns emerged. A quasi-controlled experiment. For example, a guy like Boris Diaw, a journeyman who played for five NBA teams. How did his time with the Spurs compare to his time with these other teams? Well, of the 74 players, 49 of them had a higher effective field goal percentage than their career average with the Spurs. And 39 of them had their best shooting year ever with the Spurs. So to anyone that watches basketball, this makes sense. The Spurs system created better opportunities for guys to score, and they hit a higher percentage of their shots. But this doesn't really answer our key question here. Does this have to do more with the Spurs getting the right guys, the international players that are undervalued, or is this more of a testament to the Spurs system? It's impossible not to make up of that answer right now, but either way, that highlighted a colossal inefficiency. The Spurs won a lot with a lot less money. San Antonio is back on top once again. The Spurs Going Miami mode and just buying titles is hard enough. As the Nets, Knicks, Suns, Clippers, Nets again, and Knicks, well, more than any other team by far, have proved, but winning with half the payroll, any NBA owner would want that. So, why aren't more NBA teams doing this? This is entertainment. Yeah, the people want to be entertained. We need to put butts in the seats, so we need star power. The NBA is like any entertainment business. It will only make money if it is entertaining. And they don't hide this either. All of this would suggest that the incentive for each NBA team would be to fixate on the stars in the show. But this neglects what people love, especially Americans, more than anything. It's winning. Perhaps the greatest representation of this aligned interest is the Golden State Warriors, who ascended from a below average valuation to the number one most valuable NBA team within just a matter of a few years. Steph Curry, the man in the arena during this ascension, was popular before all of this. But he became one of the most recognizable human beings on the planet after he gave the people what they wanted. Winning. Lots of it. It's over. The Golden State Warriors return to a familiar place. They're on top of the NBA world. The fourth title in eight years. Winning does a lot of things for a team. Playoff ticket sales, each round more money, regular season ticket sales and ticket prices, larger TV deals, and of course, Winning helps create stars, stars that create a feedback loop of sorts of what I just listed, along with a gravity to attract other stars, stars that only improve the valuation of a team. I mean, just imagine for a moment that you're in the owner's shoes. What is the clearest way to make money? What is the clearest way to make less money? So assuming that NBA owners and franchises are more worried about entertaining than winning would go against all the historic economic evidence and incentives here. Winning pays and winning helps create valuable stars. But this does not mean that owners, GMs, and coaches always pursue winning in the best way. Far from it. We know that the Warriors' rise can be largely attributed to the discovery of an oversight and inefficiency, this time some advanced calculus. Oh. My. God. Other teams quickly caught on, so why haven't we seen the same buy-in for ball movement? Is Spurs basketball just a thing of the past, something that can't be replicated in today's modern NBA game? Please, please subscribe if you like. Me. Returning to our FIBA tournament, think for just a moment. What is ball movement or reversals inexplicably linked to? 
coaching. Coaching that, as many fans are quick to point out, is uh, seemingly non-existent at times in the NBA. But there's more to this. Consider the following statement. Before the 2023 season concluded, three of the last four NBA head coaches to win a title had been fired. Mike Budenholzer and the Bucks won the championship in 2021. And in 2022, the Bucks lost in the second round without their second best player, Chris Middleton. And in 2023, I mean, the Bucks did really good. They won the most regular season games in the NBA. But against Miami, Giannis, pretty important player, missed two and a half games and played hurt in the opening round. And they came up short to what would prove to be a finals bound, very good heat team. And the Bucks wasted no time in firing their entire coaching staff. Similar stories can be easily found. Now, coaches get fired all the time. They're obviously bad coaches, but how is it that a coach can be valuable? What is it that they can do? Well, one of the things they can do is implement an offensive and defensive system, and coaches need to have some combination of authority and respect to do that. So why don't we just examine an NBA coach's authority uh, or leash? If at any point you upset a star, your job is in jeopardy. If your team shows any signs of stepping back, your job is in jeopardy. If your team gets hurt, your job is in jeopardy. Even if your team won more games than any other team that season and you were named the coach of the year the prior season, you just had playoff injuries, but your job is in jeopardy. The firings of Bud and Monty and many other good NBA head coaches is emblematic of an underlying inefficiency in the NBA. Uh, coaches can't really coach. I mean, how can we criticize NBA head coaches for not instituting a system if, well, Players and GMs can just completely undermine even what it means to be a coach, undermine any power that a coach seemingly would have in a normal situation. This is a systemic inefficiency, but simultaneously, it is an opportunity. There appear to be three markets where a player's ego or personal desires will not trump a coach. San Antonio, Golden State, and Miami. I find the Miami example particularly interesting. It's easy to forget the back and forth heat years after LeBron left, in and out of the playoffs, yet Spolstra wasn't fired. It would have been an easy story for Pat Riley to tell, perhaps the easiest there ever was. We only won because LeBron had D Wade. Chris Bosch was good too. But Riley had a unique patience for a GM, and Spolstra went on to construct and implement a system with seemingly less talented, less valued guys overachieving their way into two finals runs. Unquestionably, Eric Spolstra is allowed to coach. He has no fear of checking even his best players, but this is the exception. It is not the rule. The rule appears to be, well, back to our board. Teams appear to be terrified of letting a coach coach because it might just upset a player. But across the pond, don't talk, don't talk, please fucking me, don't talk. An alternate reality has evolved. My fucking diva. Just watch a game and you'll see it. Head coaches retain much more respect, allowing the ability to implement a system, allowing the ability to showcase the importance of a coach. And I want to be clear here that I'm not just advocating to allow some coach to just scream and yell. Uh, but there's a reason why coaches exist. There's a reason why that type of person even, that role exists in many different domains outside of sports. But here's where I stumbled into yet another surprising discovery. See, most fans are aware that FIBA and international rules allow for a more defensive game. It's more advantageous to the defense because of these rule differences. And this is true, but when we look at perhaps the most telling offensive statistic, points per possession, one finds that EuroLeague teams are actually more efficient than NBA teams. So is this solely because the three-point line is closer at the top of the arc? Um, I find that difficult to buy, and here's why. When comparing possession length, the average EuroLeague possession is three seconds longer, a 21% difference. This suggests that EuroLeague teams are more patient in their shot selection. And also, shooting accuracy doesn't fall, as you might think, between 22 and a half and 24 feet. Point being, EuroLeague teams are scoring at a higher rate despite these defensive advantages. 
this is perhaps the greatest inefficiency in the NBA, one that many more NBA teams should consider exploring, especially the Portland's, Orlando's, Charlotte's, those smaller market teams that are just going to continue to struggle to attract top free Asian talent. It's a way to win more with less. San Antonio has never been a big market and they did okay, but perhaps this was given a chance because it was somewhat of an anomaly. Uh, the GM at the time, Popovich, was certainly on board with the new head coach, Popovich. He hired himself and this level of executive buy-in appears to be a rarity in today's NBA market. Instead, GMs and owners chase town along with their present bias to the extreme as evidenced by another inefficiency, draft picks. Perhaps there's a fear that a systematic coach would just push away star players. NBA players wouldn't be able to handle that type of system. But here's a clip from Draymond that kind of contradicts this. Steve came in. I'm watching Steph Curry going to mixing someone. He's like, pass the ball, pass the ball. I'm like, yo. And sure enough, as we bought into the system that he was bringing to it, it always found the guys that it needed to find which is where I learned the power of the swing pass. Now, you tend to get that level of buying the coaching staff when you start winning. Obviously, the Golden State Warriors won a lot, but I think there would be plenty of NBA players that would be open to a more systematic approach. Maybe not all of them, but enough to field a very good team, enough to win more with less. Obviously, there are bad coaches that should be fired and implementing an orchestra-like offense on the penetration that's to challenging. The but these are multi-billion dollar organizations that are signing coaches to multi-million dollar contracts to do jobs that they can't even do. And if that isn't a systemic inefficiency, I guess I'm not really sure what is. Within the nebula of chaos, small, seemingly insignificant changes can compound into radically different results. And that's true, not just in basketball, but in life. In a potentially infinite cosmos, there are an infinite number of secrets to be found. Letting an NBA coach do his job might be one of them. Hope you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you haven't. Take care.